buttons. I guess I should turn that on. Um, ways to describe user interfaces that could be tools for them. Um, and the other area is in new interaction techniques, new ways of interacting with computers. Um, and the good news is this provides full employment because coming up with new interaction techniques um, or new modes often requires new software techniques. So we're going to talk today mostly about brain computer interfaces, but you might keep in the back of your mind um, how this might feed in to the next step here, which is um, think of the interfaces I'm going to describe. How would you want to program them, ideally? I mean, of course you can pr reprogram these things. Of course you can hack them up somehow. But ideally, what would be the right way to program? Just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, OK, so let's. Um, first think about HCI. This is a picture from Edward Tufte, actually, or adaptation of it, <coughs> the visualization guy. Um, I th um, he talks about two powerful information processors, roughly speaking, the person and the computer are storing information processors, um, connected to each other by a very low bandwidth you know, um, connection, which is kind of the, our, the current constraint. We're not really short of computing power. Human mental power isn't changing. Um, the constraint seems to be the connection between the two. So one of the goals of HCI, I think, is to improve the bandwidth between the user and the computer. And in particular, in lately, currently, I think we're much more um, scarce in the direction of user to computer. Computers can shower you with millions of pixels rapidly changing. Um, they're doing pretty well in bandwidth in that direction. But the bandwidth from the user is still pretty low. So here's a, it wasn't always the case. This is not the natural state of affairs. <laughs> anyone, know, anyone know what the device is in the front? That thing that looks like a typewriter? Just trying to see who. Sorry, Sorry what? ASRT. You got it. Yes, teletype. <laughs> yes. Um, so this was the way people interacted with computers. The first interactive computers after punch cards used a device like this. It looks like a typewriter. It's got a pointed keyboard. Um, what it really is just like is a shell window. Right? You type in your shell window, and the, um, the screen just keeps scrolling up, except the scrolling up thing there was a roll of paper. But that thing was an equal, uh, the input and output speeds were equal. It's about 10 characters, exactly 10 characters a second. Um, you type away, you hit return, and the computer replies chunk, 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 chunk at a speed like that. So uh, input and output bandwidth were actually about equal back then. And for extra credit, who knows who the two picture, people in the picture are? Anyone? No, it's a famous picture, really. It was a publicity picture from Bell Labs. Um, that's uh, standing up is uh, Dennis Ritchie, sitting down is Ken Thompson, the people who wrote Unix. Um, it has nothing to do with my talk. I just thought it was, if I'm going to show a picture of a teletype, I'll show you a cool one. Um, and the computer in the background is called the PDP-11. That was what they wrote Unix on. But my point was just the teletype. OK. Um, so, so I've been interested in an emerging thread of interfaces that kind of get information from a person in a lightweight sort of way, without really asking them for anything, without having you set any controls. They just sort of find out about your state. Um, there's a collection of names for this that kind of overlap in different ways. Um, Ros Picard's, for example, is up there somewhere, of affective computing. Um, we're interested in, in more in cognitive aspects than affective, but it's very similar. Um, physiological computing takes various physiological measures. Um, there are a bunch of, of things like this that, have, that are sort of overlapping. So there's a general trend, I think, in obtaining information from the user in a kind of passive way. You don't actually do something uh, that you think about. The computer just so you don't give it any explicit commands. The computer just sort of um, makes a, uh, an inference about your state. <coughs> um, uh, so inputs might be sensors. In our case, we're using brain sensors. But um, there might be other kinds of sensors. Uh, resistance across your skin is a common one. Um, they might infer things from your behavior, like how fast you're typing. They might find out things from the context, your context. All of these are kind of not intentional inputs. So we have to be very careful. Um, when your skin resistance changes, you didn't decide, all right, got to make the skin resistance go up. Um, you're just not thinking about it. It just happens. <clears throat> so we have to be very careful when we're using these very weak inputs to use them carefully. Um, anyone remember King Midas? King Midas was someone who was uh, a miser. Um, it's a Greek myth. <clears throat> and everything he was given the power that everything he touched turned to gold. So for a short while, this was really cool. 
and then he realizes like I can't eat, I can't touch it. Um, so my this idea that you have this magic power that wherever you look, I guess through eye movement interfaces, wherever you look, something happens. It's really cool for a little while, and then it's like just leave me alone. I just want to look. Um, so there's no general solution that I know. Um, but so you have to be very careful to avoid by this touch. So we the responses that we make to these very gentle inputs that you didn't really mean had better be equally gentle. Anyone remember Microsoft Clippy? Sorry, this is a cavalcade of things that um, are older than most of you. Mm. There's this horrible um, help gadget. This is shipped with Microsoft <laughs> Office. <coughs> they would try to guess what you were doing and offer you help. Um, you probably, if you remember it at all, you probably remember it from the parodies. You know. I see you were writing a suicide note. Perhaps I could, it's, you know. it was just, <laughs> it, it gave you stupid help. Imagine if it did that based on your brain signals. It'd be really annoying. So we have to be very, very gentle. Um, but it's possible. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, as a um, sort of model for this work, um, this describes some work I did on eye movement interfaces many years ago. Um, and so these are interfaces where we track your eye and the computer responds based on where you're looking. And for that, I also tried to do this same implicit approach. Um, rather than say, look there, blink twice, and the thing fires, but just look around, do whatever you normally do, use your eyes however you normally use them, and we'll find something interesting out about you and make use of that in a helpful way. So the one challenge there was I would like, ideally, to model things after the real world. If there's time at the end, I'll talk about our notion of reality-based interfaces. Um, when all else fails, um, figure out what the human body was wired for, and let's use that. I mean, there are things that you know from almost from birth, and those are very good things to rely on in user interface design. So what can I rely on from the real world um, for eye movements? Well, not a heck of a lot. There's not many things in the real world that, that um, respond to your eye movements. If I stare at Rob for a while, I'm sorry, um, it'll probably cause some effect. Um, but mostly things are not, uh, the real world doesn't really respond. If I stare at the fire alarm, I'd be astonished if I could make it go off. Um, so most things don't respond to being looked at. Um, so there's not much. Uh, Dick Bolt at the Media Lab many years ago did a very nice example um, where he has a host guiding a guest around and the, the host notices what the guest is interested in. Oh, I see you're interested in that whiteboard. Let me tell you where we got the whiteboard. And then there's other clever things. I notice that you're interested in the chairs. Noticing that you're looking at several chairs. I'll tell you about the chairs. Um, so that was very clever and it was a real world example. But there's not very much more. I mean, we're sort of running out of real world analogies. So, um, so I carved the world up a little uh, to a sort of finer grain. I said, let's have you move your eyes naturally. We're not going to ask you to do anything special, but the response will be something that the real world doesn't do. So you just look around and we'll respond. Um, so that's, and I'm doing exactly the same for brain computer interfaces. That's why I mentioned it. So our work in BCI, um, we're doing the same thing. The majority of work in brain computer interfaces these days is for people who are really disabled can't move anything, perhaps not even their eyes. Um, they call this locked-in syndrome. In many cases, your brain is perfect, and you can think just fine, and you have this miserable condition where you can't express yourself in any way. Um, and for those people, you can develop something that measures their brain signals, and they, they gradually, they sort of, it trains them, they train it. They gradually learn to think special thoughts that will trigger this. So you think about moving your right toe. Of course, your right toe doesn't move because you're disabled. Um, you think about it. We can pick up the signal that you have in your motor cortex, and right toe means turn the lights on or whatever. Um, it's workable. It's very slow and clumsy. You and I would never use this because it's too slow and clumsy. Um, but that's kind of the majority of brain-computer interface work. Um, we decided to carve off a different corner, just because everyone else is doing that. Um, so instead of bringing a monumental benefit to a very small number of users, we're trying to bring a small benefit to many users. We're trying to use BCI for all of us. <clears throat> so, so not for disabled users and not asking you to imagine moving your right toe. Just do whatever you do. Um, for uh, unrelated reasons, we're using uh, FNIRS, Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy. Um, and that's not because it's a special, an especially good match for this or not, but rather because I have a collaborator at Tufts who's one of the pioneers in this field. 
And this is a technology that has, is relatively recent. I mean, 10 years ago, there were papers still being published saying, is it really measuring the brain or not? So it's, it's quite new, whereas EEG has been around 100 years. So as a scientist, I feel like you want to dig somewhere where they haven't already been digging for 100 years. So, um, so it's just because it's new um, and, and may give us some new opportunities. So, um, so we're trying to get you do whatever you do naturally. We will respond in a way that the real world doesn't respond. Um, uh, so with this, any, how many of you are familiar with FNIRS? All right. OK, two people. Um, so the idea, it's actually a very simple uh, technology. You shine light into your head. You thought your skull was opaque, but there's a certain region of frequencies of light that go through your skull. You shine light into your head. It is absorbed or not absorbed different amounts by the oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin in your blood that's flowing around your brain. And then you put a little sensor and measure the amount of light coming back. So you shine light in, some of the light gets reflected back, and you measure how much. And that gives you a measurement of the amount of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Uh, sort of like a poor man's fMRI. It measures the exact same thing as fMRI, but only um, near the surface, about uh, one and a half, two centimeters deep. So it's deep enough to measure brain activity, not systemic activity. After extensive studies, people have agreed that that's the case. Um, and it's just different from EEG. It's neither better nor worse. Um, the response that we're measuring, so your brain, a particular part of your brain works harder, it depletes its oxygen supply, and then it calls for more oxygen. So you get deoxy goes up, I think. There, there's a curve, a, a characteristic curve. Um, so, so you can look for that pattern. That, that phenomenon takes several seconds to happen. So brain depletes the oxygen, blood sends more. This is a number of seconds. So this is very different from EEG, much, much slower. You're not going to type using this thing. Um, on the other hand, it's much more local. You stick the probe here, and you're measuring a very small area within a centimeter of the probe. How many of you have worked with EEG? So you know you stick the EEG probe here, and you got half the head. And you know, EEG just goes everywhere. So much more precise spatially, much less precise temporally. Um, so it's just complementary. And that's what we've been using. Okay, um, so oh, the other thing that I should mention, if I can make this go, <coughs> is it's very easy to set up. Um, we're using it on the forehead. Oh, we didn't really want the music for this. Uh, oh, the music went away. Okay, that's a problem later. Uh, so uh, let me start that again. Sorry. Um, why don't we get anything bad here? All right, I'm just going to run the oh. Sorry, I don't have the display over here. Did you unplug your cable? You probably might get that. Not, not, not that cable, but if you the audio cable? There's no audio camera. We're using HDMI. And sorry about that. And it did work 20 minutes ago. Mm. All right. Um, you know, let's do. Let's go back and let me just run it again and forget about the music. Oh, come on! No, I gotta get the cursor there. Okay. So, whoa. So there's the gadget. Um, it shines infrared light um, out these fiber optic cables, and then it measures them coming back over this. So when it goes out to the head, comes back. Um, the music, the fiber optic cables, end in these rubber pads two pads on your forehead, you know, run the fiber optic cable, you put a headband, like a sports headband, and that's it. That's the setup. No grease, um, you know, relatively straightforward setup. Um, we also did some experiments. Um, people are not clear on what can you actually do. So in an fMRI, you can't do anything, as you may know. Um, can I move around? In an EEG, they don't like you to move. They don't even like you to blink if they can help it. Um, so we did some experiments, and there weren't experiments. So we did some experiments just trying to find out what can you do? Can you type? Can you move around? Can you sit in a normal office? And basically the answer was they're all OK, with the exception of frowning hard, because that just pushes the sensor away physically. Um, and then light leaks in, so that one doesn't work. But other than that, this part is irrelevant. Um, other than that, it's a pretty easy setup. And um, someday, I believe this is going to be both cheap and easy. The device I showed you is very expensive, but it doesn't have to be. All it has in it is a light source and a light sensor. 
Um, if I told you we're going to have a cheap fMRI someday soon, you can laugh at me. But, um, but this thing, that it's, it's expensive because they just don't make many, very many of them. It'll be cheap someday, I believe. So in fact, we have, uh, both in my group and some colleagues, also other folks I know at Drexel, have developed, are working on developing small, wireless, probably cheap FNews devices. So I think it has a future. Anyway, uh, oops. OK, so our first experiment um, was just to see, uh, see what we can measure. And this was a test of short-term memory. We made this cube, so it looks like a Rubik's cube. And we showed it to you one face at a time. You couldn't actually see all the faces. And at the end of seeing all, each of the faces in sequence, we asked you, OK, how many reds, how many blues, how many yellows, uh, whatever the colors were. So in one case, we had only two colors. So it's pretty easy, one red, two blue, one red, two blue. And then you see the next one, you go, all right, now we're up to two red, three blue. Um, and then we went up to three colors or four colors. And we wanted to see that these are definitely, uh, we believe these are exercising short-term memory. We wanted to see if we can if we can measure the difference. We're not reading the numbers that you're holding. We don't have no idea how many blues or reds. We're just reading the capacity of your short-term memory. And indeed, we could distinguish them. <coughs> so these are accuracy, classification accuracies um, in various pairs. So doing nothing versus two colors is over there. The one that obviously works best is doing nothing versus four colors, because that's really hard. Um, and you know, it varies from, what, 60 to 90%, something like that. Uh, each colored bar is a different subject, so it's five subjects here. So we can distinguish, not perfectly, but we can distinguish um, how much you're holding in short-term memory. And uh, don't tell the paper referees this, but this, um, because they're very precise about prefrontal cortex oxygenation, but this really correlates with a lot of different other things going on in your brain. Kind of e executive activity, time sharing, general mental busyness in cognitive tasks, it all correlates with this quite nicely. Um, okay, so, so that was our first experiment. And now we're left with, okay, so we got something that can measure a short amount of short-term memory in play. Uh, what can we do with it in HCI? Um, it's easier, by the way, to do FNIRs on the forehead because you don't have hair. It's possible where there's hair. Um, we had one, uh, we have a postdoc where every few months shaves his head. Um, there, <laughs> we thought about recruiting bald subjects and we'll put in small print. This is untested, but might be a cure for baldness. Um, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, we've, been cons we've been so far sticking with the, uh, the forehead. We have a new probe that can supposedly go through hair, but haven't done it yet. Um, so, as he, so that's sort of the uh, biomedical engineering part, which is mostly um, with help from my colleague Sergio Fantini in biomedical engineering. Um, now we move to HCI. So okay, you have this gadget, um, what are we gonna do with it? So we, this is definitely technology push. We have a hammer, now let's look for some nails. So um, how would you like to use this? So these are some of the things we could measure, short-term memory workload, um, multitasking, I'll show you that one, preference, I'll show you. Um, so that's, they're all roughly related. Um, so we're gonna have a system where you operate it as usual with a mouse and keyboard, but at the same time as you operate it, it causes your brain to function differently, and we're gonna measure the brain as well. So the inputs to the system are the usual inputs plus of the brain input. Uh, also here, just to give you an idea, is an example of the data you get from this thing. So we have 16 channels, actually, if you were watching very closely, there are four uh, prisms, four, four fibers on each of the two probes, and each of those shines two different colors of light, uh, time multiplex. One color is in near infrared, one is just over the line. Um, one measures oxy and one measures deoxyhemoglobin. Um, and these are four of the 16 channels, and all we want is for somewhere in there to be able to distinguish the three conditions in this experiment, which are different colors. So at the b these are folded, um, so these are all the trials of, of this condition. Um, that's about uh, 40 seconds long, each of these, these pictures. Um, and of course, at the beginning of the trial, you can't get anything because the user hasn't started doing anything yet. And after they're into the trial a little bit, you see some separation. We don't care which of them separates, just so we can get a separation. So that bottom left one pretty cleanly separates, for example. Um, this requires a heavy dose of machine learning. Um, when we started doing this work, we would take our, our plots and bring them to the biomedical, our friends in biomed, and they say, oh, I'm looking at this, and I think the workload went up right here, and it went down right there. 
That's nice, but we're going to build an automatic system that does this online. Uh, we can't just have you sit in the lab all day. So, um, they, so machine learning was a big help there. We could get um, much better results than they were accustomed to. So, um, so the, f I'm gonna, the first one I'm going to describe was not actually the first experiment we did, but it's the one that's most straightforward and quick to describe. <clears throat> so we were building, we, uh, we used a, simu a UAV simulator. So you're piloting a bunch of drone airplanes. And for those of you who remember Missy Cummings, this was actually developed in her lab. Um, because we thought if we use an independently developed stimulus, that's better than if we just make something up to test our own system. <clears throat> so this is an interface for controlling several drones. Um, apparently, currently, if you're driving drones, one person drives one drone or possibly even two people drive one drone in the military. Um, uh, in the future, one person will drive several drones. So it becomes a time-sharing task. You tell this drone to go here, and he goes for a little while, and then you check with this one, he goes there, you gotta check back with this one in case something happens. So you're time sharing. And you guessed it, you get this nice short-term memory load because of time sharing. So the question was, how many drones should you control? Um, we could have a rule of thumb, but that might not be so good. We could have, um, it could depend on what they're doing. I could have two drones, but it's a very difficult situation because they're gonna crash at each other, or 10 drones that are all going in the same direction for half an hour and no problem. Um, also, your state may be different. Maybe you were out drinking last night and you're not so good at the drones. So we'd like to adapt this to your current state. So um, you can see where this is going. We measure your um, brain state, short-term memory workload, and we use it to add or remove drones slowly. So when your workload goes up, we take away a drone. The scenario is you're working on a team and one of your team members takes the drone. When your workload goes down, we don't want you to be bored. So below a certain amount, we give you an extra drone to handle. Um, and, uh, and then you run this thing. So the nice thing about this is it's a closed environment with known metrics. So I don't want to do an experiment where we ask the people at the end, so how do you like our system? Like, uh, scale of one to five, I give it a four. What does that mean? Um, so, so we're trying to we're, we're trying to do things in a system where we can get objective measurements. So in this case, this was a, there's a whole scenario that goes with this. You have to get the drone to the correct location. It has to not run into the target, the, uh, those blue boxes, which are radars or something. So um, there's a, a set environment, and you know when you're succeeding. And we got better performance, um, mainly in this first of uh, um, errors, user errors. The user made less errors when we gave them the right amount of work, not too much and not too little. Um, so it, we're looking to get an objective improvement out of this thing. So we don't know if the, uh, if the system is correct, if the machine learning system is correctly classifying the user state. We have no ground truth for this. But we do know that the end-to-end -end system gives better performance. So that makes us happy. <coughs> um, here's another one. My uh, student, Erin Solovey, did this one. <clears throat> um, she was looking at m measuring multitasking or interruption. So um, there are two kinds of interruptions that have been identified. One kind, you're doing a stupid repetitive task. If I interrupt you, you can go right back to it, no problem, like whack-a-mole. Um, in another, you're doing something with some context. You're writing a computer program, for example. So um, if I interrupt you, it'll cost you something. Apparently, you can measure that at the moment of the interruption. Um, it's, it's almost like you can imagine a context switch and you have to put some stuff in short-term memory to, in order to get back to it. So you can measure these two kinds of interrupt, this different kind of interruption. Um, the, the difficult kind the, uh, is called branching. So, um, so again, we built this kind of system um, where we measure your brain. I should have mentioned before, there's a bunch of other steps here. We filter out noise. The data you get out of this thing is quite noisy. And then you filter out breathing. Every time you take a breath, you get more oxygen. You filter out heartbeat. Every time your heart beats, um, you, you get more total blood. So you do a bunch of filtering, then you do it, you train a machine learning model, and then you have a classifier that runs in real time. Okay. Yeah? And filtering is just done by frequencies? The breathing yes. And the heartbeat? Yes, definitely. Um, generally, yes. And in fact, lately we've been playing with just don't even bother filtering, just let machine learning do everything. And that sometimes works too. But yeah, they're, they're sort of known frequencies. Um, so in this case, um, we had two robots. This is the robot's eye view, two robots stacked one on top. This is the picture is stacked one on top of the other. <coughs> and the you're driving the robots around, and you have to time share between them. So send this robot over there, send this robot, check back with this robot. 
Um, and again, there's a task that this whole thing is embedded in. The robots have to travel in a certain way. They have to find a high signal strength. Every time they go somewhere, they test the signal strength. So there's a scenario and a measurable outcome. Um, and what we did is when the user, um, yeah, um, when the user's um, workload or really prediction of this branching type of activity went up, um, we put one of the robots on autopilot. The assumption is autopilot is not as good as direct human control. Otherwise, you don't need any of this. Um, autopilot is a second best, but if you're in a jam, autopilot is useful. So, um, so the one robot was always manual. The other robot sometimes went on autopilot, sometimes not, when we measured branching, when we detected branching. Um, we had a control condition where the thing never went on autopilot. And then Aaron had the very good idea that what if we're doing, everything we're doing is like hocus pocus. It's just nothing. How about we turn it backwards? When the system says put the robot on autopilot, put it off of autopilot <laughs> and backwards. So, you know, I plug it in backwards, um, swap those two arms and arms just to can make sure that we're doing something here. Because this, you know, this is pretty flaky. Uh, and indeed, so in this chart, higher is better. The robot is supposed to find a certain number of targets. So when the robot uh, went on autopilot at the right time was better than when it never went on autopilot, and that was better than when it, when it went on autopilot at the wrong time. So this made us feel a little more confident that we're getting something um, real here. Uh, let me describe this one briefly. So we also were able to get a signal for preference. This one is a weaker signal, um, but it's sort of an economic preference, like Pepsi or Coke kind of preference. Which thing would you? buy or choose. Um, so we tried to do this with movies, uh, actually just IMDB pages, because we're not going to sit still and watch a whole movie for this. Um, so we show people an IMDB page, and we want to predict their rating of the IMDB page, not the actual movie. So show them the thing, and um, the same deal, we, we train a classifier first, and then we, uh, we predict what they would say, how well they would like this movie. Um, and then we feed that to a movie recommender engine. That's the, the second piece of machine learning that is not part of our research. Um, it's just, it's like a poor man's version of Netflix. Yeah? Do you really need the, the actual IMDb for this? Because it seems like that's so cool, you know, it's just the example. Oh, selected movies. Sure, sure. It's just the example you showed actually had two movies, one of them much more yeah. popular display, like the ad on the right. Um, the like that. Did you kill the ad? Probably, I don't remember. Um, probably, I, I don't know, um, I hope so, <laughs> but um, good point. So um, we show you the, the web page, we, uh, we measure the rating that we think you would give this movie, and then in addition we ask you for your rating, but we're not using that in the rest of the experiment. That's just to verify what we're doing. Um, and then we use the inferred rating, the, the measured rating, um, to see whether we think you would like the movie. And then based on that, that goes into the recommendation engine, we recommend the next movie for you. So if this, so the, the black, you sort of got to squint your eyes a little bit, the black uh, lines, uh, these are the ratings of the movies, the black lines make kind of a bell curve, Gaussian distribution, and the gray lines are skewed upward. So with the control condition, the movies you saw just formed a normal distribution. With the brain condition, you saw more movies that were better for you. Here's an easier way to clear way to understand it. In the control condition, as you saw more and more movies, they didn't get any better, as you might imagine. In the brain condition, you gradually got movies that were better. And they weren't just better in general. It wasn't that we were just slowly moving toward blockbusters. Um, different people got different better movies. So the, there were better movies for them. Um, and our favorite quote from this one was somebody said, can I go back and write down some of those movies? I think I'd like them. Um, so it's a small effect, but um, again, this is asking no effort on the part of the user. You just watch these cards, and we take this information and use it to suggest what they do. You may have done this first, and I missed it, but um, sort of did this end-to-end -end thing with movies with predicting uh, on rating movies, but did you, did you sort of measure the correlation between what the rate said and what they said about each movie? Yes. It must have been, or we would have abandoned this at that point. <laughs> I don't remember. I, um, it must have been. Sorry. Um, so this is a potpourri of, of students' work over a number of years. Um, okay. 
Um, maybe, how are we doing on time? Maybe we'll skip, but anyone know what bubble cursor is? Oh, okay, lots of people know. All right, all right several people. Um, so bubble cursor is an idea that lets you be, everyone knows what Fitts law is, because you all took HCI with wrong, yeah. Um, so uh, it's a way, it's a scheme to let you beat Fitts law. If you know what's on the screen, you go from here, I'm heading there, do I really have to go all the way there? It's the only thing on the screen. Um, I could just jump the cursor here. So the idea of bubble cursor is you make the area of the cursor that can select that item, the area of the item that can be selected larger. So those gray lines, gray circles are invisible. They just indicate that if the cursor gets up to the gray circle, the thing is selected. So the question, once again, uh, in all of our work is we have a parameter that needs to be controlled. It's too much trouble to control it, we think, by hand, like how busy are you. Um, I need a magic third hand connected to your brain that can adjust this thing. So the scenario is a little complex, I'll spare you. Um, but um, they, they, we had a bunch of targets, they had different priorities, and as the experiment, as the time ran down, you had to get the high priority ones, you got like two cents more in the experiment. Um, so when, when we detected that it would be helpful, we made some of the targets expand much more. Again, in motor space, not visible. Um, and once again, uh, I won't show you this. Um, once again, um, we got um, significantly better results. That one's a little subtle. I think I'd rather show you other ones. Um, so we worked a little on music interfaces after that. Um, so um, what we're not trying to do is sort of spooky brain music. There are people who've done put the EEG cap on, measure your EEG. Sorry if any of you have done this. It's a lovely art project. It's not what we were trying to do. Um, so get um, EEG signals, process them in some way, feed them to a synthesizer, and make cool music inspired by your brain. Um, we were trying to give you, it's fine, it's not what we did. Um, we were trying to give you control. So can, uh, a musician is an example of someone who wants a lot of control. <coughs> My image is a pipe organ, an organist at a giant organ console, <coughs> which is, um, I think of it as like a jet fighter cockpit. You know, tons of knobs and dials. Have you ever seen one of these things? They're amazing. Tons of knobs and dials, stuff everywhere. Severe time constraints. When you're playing music, you can't be late. People notice. Um, except nobody gets hurt in this one. <laughs> so um, we tried a much uh, you know, greatly scaled down thing. So here's the idea. Um, you're playing very, very simple music. We used uh, people who were, uh, had a small amount of piano lessons but didn't really play well. Um, and we asked them to either play what's given or improvise a very, very simple piece with like two notes, one in each hand. And under some conditions, we gave them extra notes. We gave them some harmony for free. Um, and in some conditions, we turned it off. And once again, we have this sort of third hand. When should we turn on the accompaniment and when not? And we did it by, you guessed it, um, prefrontal cortex workload. Uh, and now you're about to not hear the video, I think. Uh, I don't know. We right. present uh, files for brain automated oh, yes. adaptive harmonies in a musical cool. system. Brahms is a novel okay. brain computer interface integrated with a musical instrument. It adapts passively to users' cognitive state during musical improvisations. The system adds or removes musical harmonies based on users' cognitive state as measured with FMEA, a brain sensing technology. Our research showed that users preferred this novel musical instrument over other conditions because they felt more creative. Here, the user plays a single note with their right hand with no adaptation by the system. Here, the system adds a note, one octave above the user's note, slightly so enriching Sometimes on, sometimes off. Here, the user plays a single note with their left hand with no adaptation by the system. For the left hand adaptation, the system adds the octave below as well as the third of the chord. Yeah, this adds to do over again, we do a fifth. The third is kind of low. The user can also play both hands will adapt to each hand independently. You can hear the musical richness added by the system even though the user only plays one note with each hand. Here, a user creates an unscripted musical improvisation using a simple 1-4-5-1 chord progression as a starting point.
at some point it'll turn on. At this point, you can hear Freedom the musical. musical editions just came in. This guy's actually a very good pianist for the video, but we've tried this on not very good pianists. <clears throat> we talked to folks in the music department, and their general answer was, no, thank you. I've spent 20 years learning to use a normal piano. No. <laughs> um, so it's more for energy. <clears throat> Um, before we did this, we did another experiment just to be sure that you could measure difficulty while playing the piano. We had only previously done mouse and keyboard. And stuff. at this point, the additions were removed by the system. Um, so we, we gave you a hard piece and an easy piece. Well, easy was extremely easy. And I asked you to play, took the mental workload, and got very clean data. It was actually our cleanest classifier. So, so we were confident we could separate hard and easy. We did well. Let's keep this going. Um, we did one other um, experiment in learning, uh, or this one's in learning. This was a little different. Um, you're, how many of you learned to play the piano, took piano lessons once in your life? Plenty of you, thank you. Um, so you probably remember when you're learning a new piece, the teacher says, all right, now play the right hand. Play the right hand, you know, keep playing the right hand until you get it right, and now play the left hand. So we thought maybe the right criterion is not can you play the right hand perfectly, but can you play it perfectly with low mental effort? If I can just barely play the right hand, maybe I'm not ready for the left. So we thought, let's pass you on when you play the piece, the part correctly and with low mental effort. In this particular case, it's a four-part Bach chorale, so there are actually four parts to learn. Uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, come on. So learn here. Piano with Bach. An adaptive oh, learning interface so this that is a little increases different task approach. difficulty based on brain sensing. Bach, for Brain Automated Chorale, is an adaptive musical learning system based on brain sensing that helps piano players learn Bach chorales. Bach uses functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNIR, which has been demonstrated by HCI researchers to measure user cognitive workload. Participants were presented with varying difficulty levels of a Bach chorale. Using Bach, we measured the cognitive workload of participants to determine when they could cognitively handle a higher difficulty level. And these were very Bach modest the ability pianists. Which is what we as learners' cognitive workload fell below a certain threshold, indicating that the learner could handle more information. Each level added a full line of music. Participants were given 15 minutes to learn a piece with Bach and 15 minutes to learn a piece the way they normally do in a control condition. They played the pieces once all the way through at the end of the practice session. This final performance was recorded and analyzed for accuracy and speed. Performance data showed that participants played with increased speed and accuracy when they learned with Bach. Furthermore, participants said that they felt that they played better and learned more easily with Bach. Bach demonstrates that a real-time adaptive brain-computer can improve learning in pianists so we by monitoring and adapting to cognitive work. So we were very careful to not make larger claims about learning. But the more we've talked about this paper with people, people seem to be willing to accept that this might apply to other kinds of learning. But it's sort of not my field. And we said, just, we'll teach you how to play this piano piece. Uh, let's move ahead a little bit. Uh, well, let's not. Let's talk about Google Glass. But, uh, let's, let's talk about a couple of new things. So, so current work we're working on is to try to expand this. You're beginning to see we have a hammer and we're looking for nails. And so we're trying to think about ways to expand this agenda. One way is to include other kinds of measurements. Um, so we're currently relying entirely on FNIR's prefrontal cortex, but we want to expand this to the usual kinds of things like EDA, skin resistance, heart rate, um, body temperature, um, con other kinds of measurements that are more common in this field. <clears throat> Another thing we did for a little while, but we've kind of abandoned this for now. Anyone familiar with TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation? 
good. Uh, someone. <laughs> um, so this is a, a scheme where you put a direct current current through your head, and it seems to modify your brain a little. It's not quite as scary as the MEG, this very powerful magnetic stimulation. Um, it's a low voltage, like a volt or two. Um, and it seems to activate one area of the brain more and one area of the brain less. It's a direct current, so it's a plus and a minus. Um, and seems to sort of change the balance. It can't overall increase your brain, but it changes the balance of power in your brain. Um, what we want, and it's been used a little bit in therapy, use it for PTSD, and there they're looking for a long-term effect. They'd like to bring you in, give you a half-hour treatment, send you home, and like you're cured, or come you know, every week or something like that. We wanted just the opposite. We wanted a very short-term effect, which in our first experiment we were not able to get. Um, we're thinking, imagine that airplane scenario. Um, you've got more, air, more airplanes are coming, and now we got to the point where another airplane is arriving and there's nobody else to help you. It's above your ability, but you've got you to do this job. So that would be the moment we'd give you a little zap. You would increase your performance just enough to solve this problem, and then we're not going to zap you forever. We're going to let you go back to normal. That was the idea. So we'd have a sort of a two-way brain communication. In our first experiment, um, we were not able to get a short enough term effect. I want this thing to respond fairly quickly and to go away quickly. It took us nine minutes to get a response, and I don't know how long it takes to go away. We didn't wait that long. So, so we wanted the opposite of what most people want from TDCS. Um, but uh, that's the setup. We did do this experiment. We're currently running an experiment where we're going to change the mode of interruptions. Most interruption projects um, change, just postpone interruptions. We're thinking, how about we just give you the interruption by a, a different mode? depending on your mental state. And as I mentioned, we're interested in how should you program all this stuff. Of course, we already programmed it. Uh, not do that, and not do that. <coughs> Another thing we're interested in is, uh, this is a very tentative taxonomy. It's sort of a two-dimensional taxonomy <coughs> for these kinds of interfaces. Um, there are, um, in some cases, when the brain state changes, something happens right away, like an extra airplane appears. In some cases, it changes something in the future. When we make a brain measurement, it changes future movie recommendations. Um, and then in some cases, it changes the user interface only. In some cases, it changes the actual job you have to do. So that's sort of a two-dimensional taxonomy we have at the moment for these kind of interfaces. But this is open to fixing and interpretation. <coughs> in the future, I mentioned FNIR's stuff I think is going to be very cheap. This is a, a group in our EE department <coughs> built this little device. It's so big, goes on your forehead. <coughs> um, the sensors are right there, like you see the sensor and the um, source light there. Um, and in this case, it's just IR LED and a photodiode. Um, this one isn't sensitive enough to get good brain measurements, but I have another student who's developed another one. This is, this is going to happen. Um, the, these things will, will, I think, get plenty cheap. Whoops. I ah, don't want to do that. Sorry. Um, actually, maybe let's stop there. Uh, let's just do that. Okay, so questions and suggestions, please, for where you think this ought to go next. I'm sort of ready to expand this agenda. Okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you. And one of the questions can be, what about reality-based interfaces? You promised to tell us about that in the abstract. <laughs> or not, if you want to talk about this stuff. So. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, for music, I think um, one thing that I would find helpful in education um, is, uh, is, in, um, is uh, based on workload, to vary the complexity of a notation of, of a piece that you're playing all the way through. Mm. Because very often it'll be just, um, you know, you'll play most of the piece fine, but there'll be some section that you're not mm -hmm. so sure about mm -hmm. or you have trouble with or that you think is difficult or something. So you like the By notation, you're not changing the notes that I'm supposed to play, or are you? Oh, or are uh, you just well, changing the way it's represented, yeah, giving me fingerings? And yeah, so uh, for if you're playing like, um, uh, you know, with Tavisors and some mm -hmm. road stuff, and you're playing with other people, mm -hmm. okay, generally the choice that you have to make on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is kind of how much complexity you put in. So at least complexity is you're just playing along with the chords. Mm -hmm. So you're going to change actually what I play, not just how it's well, explained to me. It's in a 
notation is trying to tell the youth, the musician, mm -hmm. what to play next. Right? But the decision about what you're going to play next is going to be based on your cognitive load. Okay, yes. And the notation can't, you know, normally the notation can't reflect that. So you're playing from either uh, a score mm -hmm. or you're playing from a fake sheet. Yeah, so it gives sure. You a little bit of information. Mm -hmm. I like it. Thank you. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, yeah Rob. Um, in any of these uh, sort of interventions you've mm -hmm. designed where uh, the system is adapting based on um, its sense of cognitive load, do you ever visualize for the user what the cognitive load was to put it on the screen? Ah, good question. As an indicator that yes. they might or might not notice or respond to mm -hmm. Each of my students, mm -hmm, each of my students said, "Can we put an indicator to show when the thing thinks your cognitive workload is high or not?" And my preference has always been no. Um, I don't want you to think about this. I don't want it to become a biofeedback system where you like you make the red light go on, make the red light go off. Um, just you know, we're not trying to fool you. You clearly have the brain monitor on, but just don't think about it. Is the premise, and we'll do the right thing for you. So I've been trying to avoid doing that. Um, I don't know if that's a good decision or not, but um, I feel like just leave you alone. Another interesting thing would be just self-reflection in general. Maybe we just show you your state and nothing happens just to help you understand what's going on. Um, yes, it mostly uh, came to my mind when looking at the practicing the music mm -hmm. practicing part, which oh. is the awareness of how well they've learned something. You know, we're all sort of susceptible yeah. to these illusions of fluency. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Yes. Um, Yeah, I mean, so far, just based on my personal bias, we haven't done that. Uh, we are starting to work on another area. Anyone know about default mode network? It's all the rage in psychology. I didn't know that until recently. Um, this is the idea that when you are, that it's not just about mental workload. When you're basically doing nothing, you're not really doing nothing. You're thinking about, I gotta get milk on the way home. You're just you know, going over your to-do list. Your brain is busy just doing random, perhaps, junk. Um, and so it might be plenty busy, but it's busy in a different way. And apparently, uh, so they talk about this as task positive network, which is when you're actually doing something, and default mode network, which is your brain is sort of idling. And um, so it may be that your workload is still high, but it's different, and we're trying to detect that. Um, for that, we want to measure not only the forehead, but one other spot, which is why we have another probe. And we're, we're trying to detect um, this state. Um, it comes up a lot in meditation, you get that state. So, so we're doing something in that vague direction, but nothing's actually working well yet. Yeah, Dave. Hmm. Okay, so firstly, in the airplane one, we were not just reducing load, we were trying to keep them in the zone. So when, they get, when their load goes down, we give them more airplanes. So we're trying to keep them in some middle range, but that, that doesn't answer the question of what, diff what the right zone is. Um, so no, I've been, uh, we haven't adjusted it. We've been relying on performance measurements. So how well did they do their job of whatever they're supposed to do the airplanes? But we haven't found different levels. Yeah, I, know. I do find, so, uh, well, sorry. yes, uh, yes, go ahead. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So uh, you're saying when, when we get to a certain mental state, we should change the pills? Huh, we've thought about that in another direction, which is when you, you're very busy, 
we should make the menus simple, for example, simplify the menus. Or uh, I had this one example I didn't show, um, where you're using a um, GPS direction system. When your workload is high, we give you just the main streets. And when it's low, we give you more information. And when it's really low, we give you tourist information. That's not the same as what you said, but that's the closest we've done. But it's a good idea. Henry, yeah. Yeah, related to that sort of um, one thing about you know, intelligent agents is you have an agent trying to predict your intent and that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the reactions of the users were very different depending on what their workload was. So users who have time to read through every one of their messages didn't want help for the system. So mm -hmm. They were doing all that. Whereas users who were chronically overloaded, they always had more email that they mm -hmm. could possibly respond to and more appreciative mm -hmm. of having some help with it. Yeah, so the closest analogy I'm thinking of is that robot that when you were busy, it used the inferior autopilot. It was inferior to personal handling. Uh, and then when you yeah, weren't busy, not exactly it's not the same, but the same. It's, that was the closest I could think of. Can you say a little bit more about the simulation work? Like, you know, how um. accurately can you target particular areas of the brain and where do you position mm -hmm. I can say a little, but nobody really knows. It's a relatively new area. Um, basically, it's, since it's DC current, there's a, as I say, a plus and a minus. I think, I forget which is which. One, one side of the thing tends to make that part of the brain have lower activation levels and the other side higher. It's sort of a zero something. Um, so the classic one is you could make the left side, which one is it? The left side of the brain more active, the right side of the brain less active, and you could draw better. You know, that this is. Um, so it's, that's what it seems to do. It's not terribly well studied. Um, it's not easy to get the IRB to approve it, but we did. <laughs> I got it. Uh, on the other hand, I feel like um, any idiot, well, if Radio Shack was still around, any idiot who could find a Radio Shack and a nine volt battery can do this at home. So it's really, and there are, um, I don't recommend this, but you can find on the web instructions to build your own and stick it on your head. Um, if you haven't finished your degree yet, you might want to wait. Um, but um, but anyway, so it's something that, uh, unlike fMRI, it's something that will get experimented on widely because you can't stop it. Um, the, it's, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's roughly one area becomes easier to activate and one area becomes harder to activate. Um, supposedly, um, shooting a rifle, which requires steadiness, becomes easier. You hardly even think about it and just shoot. I haven't shot a rifle. We had, uh, we had a news report, we, uh, reporter come, and she really, really wanted to try this. So we it. Um, I don't know that it was that fabulous an experience for her. Oh, another minor point is, um, it, just as a protocol thing, um, we do, you just do a sham stimulation. You feel a little tingling, like when you lick a nine volt battery. You feel a little tingling when you get this thing. And of course, we don't want you to know whether you're getting it or not, the experiment. Um, so the standard protocol is you give a little zap and then you fade the thing down. So you just feel the tingling, but the current goes away for one condition, and the other condition, you keep it on. That's just a little bit of technique. Yeah. No, it works great. So they do these half hours. Oh, well, uh, well, it's a zero sum game. You're emphasizing one part of the brain at the expense of another. And maybe you need that part. Yeah, but the other thing is, I want to make something interactive. So the idea is we would have, I didn't really say that, the idea is we would have FNIRs running and this thing running. The FNIRs would detect when you need a zap. And you just, you know, and then when your workload is down, you don't need a zap anymore. It was to make this sort of two-way brain-computer interface. And the, uh, yeah, the assumption, yeah. Yeah, you, someone else had a question. You had a question, yeah. Yeah, not so much in frequency. I mean, you saw that picture, the thing that, uh, thing, trial starts and it just goes down, 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 or up, 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 up. It's just, you know, for the solid 30-second trial, it tends to just go one way. 
there's not a lot of, of anything high frequency is probably noise. 